All right, we're going to start in just a moment. It's now 4.30 in New York and uh, 8.30 in the UK, I believe. It is. It certainly is. Yeah. Hi, John. Good to see you. Hold on a sec. Let's wait for Daisy and Zach. Hello. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Do you hear me, fellow panelists? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me okay? okay? Good. Yes, and we and I hear you. Um, okay, and apparently we have 484 people on the call. Um, that's fantastic. Um, uh, to, uh, to those 496, 98, 500 people now, um, we apologize in advance for technical glitches. Uh, we've all been uh, participant. We've all been audience members in Zoom webinars, but uh, because the and we were going to originally just run this as a as a regular Zoom call, my account can handle up to 500 people. But but uh, Claire and Daisy were finding that the interest is so great that we had to upgrade and buy a special webinar package on Zoom, which we don't really know how to use, but it seems to be working. So we're off and running. Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is John Haidt. I'm the author of. Oh wait, hold on a second. So well, this is this is the U.S. cover, but this is the one. This is the U.K. cover of the Anxious Generation, um, and uh, we're we're here today because. Um, the U.S. and the U.K. and all the English-speaking countries are going through an incredible, horrific mental health crisis in our teens, and it's exactly the same in all of the English-speaking countries. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, and when I saw, so, um, well, we'll each introduce ourselves, but the big picture is uh, Zach and I, Zach is my research partner, the, the lead researcher on the book. Um, when we read this Guardian article about, I think the headline was, it just went crazy or something like that about Claire and Daisy, uh, it was clear that, you know, the revolution that we're trying to launch in the US, it launched in the UK literally in February. And the UK, you're ahead of us. And our goal is to make that happen in the US. And our goal is to make your revolution far more successful. Isn't that great for Americans wanting the British revolution to succeed? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, so what we're going to do tonight is um, I'm going to, I'm going to give just a short part of my my sort of standard book talk to sort of lay out what we think is happening, and then Claire and Daisy will will ask me quest some questions. We'll we'll get through and 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 Zach too. We'll we'll cover some of the major topics, and then we'll have time for for your questions. Um, so Claire and Daisy, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourselves and your organization? Lovely. Thank you very much, John. Um, it's amazing to have you here. It's amazed, amazing to have all of you here. Um, I'm Claire, uh, co-founder of Smartphone Free Childhood. Um, I think if you told me and Daisy a few weeks ago that we'd be interviewing Jonathan Haidt in front of lots and lots of parents across the UK, we would have thought you were pretty mad. Um, so yeah, as you know, we started a WhatsApp group about five weeks ago. It was just two of us. Uh, we felt like we, you know, were going a bit mad. We felt like we were having had a bit of an impossible choice going on. We could either um, buy our children phones when they went to secondary school uh, and all the risks that we know that, that may come with that. And or we could run the risk of them being feeling like they're the odd ones out. And we just felt like this was an impossible choice to have. So we set up a WhatsApp group. We really thought that we were the only ones or that there may be just a few of us talking about this. And we never, ever dreamt that so many of you all felt the same. And that wave of kind of support and solidarity that that hit us has just been incredible. Um, so we're so glad and so relieved to be able to come together on this. Um, and yeah, given that this has been an accidental movement, it's actually extraordinary that there are now tens of thousands of parents um, across the UK in every county um, and, you know, lots and lots of school subgroups as well popping up everywhere and the momentum is just continuing. Um, so yeah, we feel like we lifted the lid on something accidentally. Um, and you know, in the last few weeks, there've been some very surreal moments for us, but I think the chance to speak to, to you, Jonathan, is a definite high point, so thank you. Um, and I'm gonna hand over to Daisy. Thanks, Claire, and hi, everyone. Um, I'm Daisy, co-founder with Claire of Smartphone Free Childhood. And <clears throat> I'll back what you say there, Claire, and say this is extremely surreal. Um, and really, really exciting to be here with Jonathan Haidt because he has really been the fire to this movement that we've um, accidentally started. Um, he's been described as a modern day prophet and um, one of the most important psychologists in the world today. Um, and the brilliant thing, like I've been reading his book, it's amazing. Um, and the brilliant thing 
it does is it crystallizes that sense that we've all got. I imagine everyone on this call that there's something wrong, um, something not right about our kids and smartphones. And he's um, taken that and he's turned it into um, that sense of unease into a really scientifically robust, evidence-packed, um, urgent call to action. Um, so it's, I'd say it's basically the Bible for all the parents like us who feel that childhood has taken the wrong step since the iPhone was released, um, however many years ago it was. Um, and it's enabled us all to speak up at last and say, this is not okay. Um, so tonight, um, Jonathan's going to give us a 20 minute talk and then we'll, um, and his thesis, on the great rewiring of childhood, and then we'll um, go through questions that you all sent in. Um, and then maybe if there's questions in the, um, coming up in the chat, we can go to some of those as well. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So yeah, without further ado, let's go okay. to you, Jonathan. Sure. Just two things. First, um, just say you started a WhatsApp group. Just say how it became a website, and it, you know what do you want people to do? You want all the parents mm. on this call, all British parents, and I suppose even American, but it's most going to be you know British parents on this call should go to what address? Um, Smartphonefreechildhood.co.uk is our website. And then um, we've also got an Instagram smart, at Smartphone Free Childhood. And we've also got WhatsApp groups in every county. So if you are in Surrey or you're in Scotland, find your WhatsApp group, join it and um, start one for your school. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, Zach, please introduce yourself. Hey, well, thank you so much for uh, having us here. Um, so I'm Zach Rausch. I am John's research partner and i um, I definitely came at this issue uh, very differently than than other people. I, uh, to be honest, I didn't realize how big of an issue this was until I started working with John. I was much more convinced that the problem was around uh, the overprotection part of the story. Um, and then when I started looking at the data and the trends that John's going to be talking about, um, I became completely convinced and realized uh, just how important this movement uh, is right now. And um, so if, um, I'm probably going to uh, hide my video while you know everybody talks, but if anybody has any questions for me as the researcher, I'm, I'm here. So thank you. Um, okay, then with, without further ado, um, I'm gonna, I'll just give, uh, give you an overview. I'll lay out some of the stats. Uh, and then I'll, turn, I'll I'll unshare my screen and we'll we'll continue conversing. So I'm going to do share screen desktop to share. Uh, let's see. Here we are. Okay. So uh, Claire and Daisy, just give me a thumbs up if you see my my opening slide. Looks good. Okay. All right. Here we go. Uh, okay. So um, here, let's start here. Uh, so you know, as I said, I, I saw this uh, article in in uh, the Guardian a few weeks ago, and and it, you know it was just clear that the revolution has begun in the UK. Um, uh, you guys are at a tipping point, and we're about to be at a tipping point in the US as well. Parents everywhere are fed up, just as Claire and Desi, Daisy were saying. We've all seen it. We've watched it grow. We're all confused. We're all struggling. Something is deeply wrong. I, I want to tell you now what that something is. So uh, the anxious generation, I can summarize it in two ways. First, I can say the play-based childhood faded out gradually uh, from 1980 to 2010. Um, in Britain, you didn't have as much of a crime wave as we did in the 70s and 80s, but even still, you guys overprotected your kids beginning, especially in the 90s. So we children lost the play-based childhood and it was replaced by a phone-based childhood uh, between 2010 and 2015. It wasn't gradual, it was incredibly fast. 2010 to 2015 was the great rewiring of childhood. The millennials are okay in their mental health because they were largely through puberty when this happened. Gen Z are the kids who got this at the beginning of puberty and it has affected them. Another way to say this is that we have overprotected our children in the real world and we have underprotected them online. So uh, this is the outline of my sort of standard book talk, and I, I won't be giving all of that. We'll be doing most of this in discussion. But I want to show you, especially from part one, the the data on this. It's absolutely stunning. Uh, and there's a lot of British data, too. America has the best data. We have all these longitudinal studies every year. Britain, you have some very good data, too. And in Europe, it's a little less. So but we've got data from Europe as well. Um, so this is data uh, summarizing the the various disabilities of American college students. In 2010 and 2012, all of the students were millennials, born 1981 to 1995. 
And it's only at 2013, 2014 that Gen Z begins to come in. And you can see that their rates are a little higher on those things, except for the yellow line. The yellow line is psychological disorders. The difference between Gen Z and millennials is that Gen Z has much, much higher rates of psychological disorder than say their older siblings who might've been born in 1993. Gen Z is 1996 and later. Some say 97, Gene Twenge says 95. I kind of just split the difference and said 96 is about where it starts. Uh, now, in all the graphs I'm going to show you, so this is uh, American data first, uh, what you'll see is that the rates of various illnesses, the rates were level between uh, before 2010. There's no sign of a problem. If you stop collecting data in 2010, 2011, there's no sign of a problem. These are the rates of various disorders of American undergraduate students. And uh, when we go past 2010, what happens? We get a large increase, especially in depression and anxiety. Those rates more than double among American college students. Um, now, maybe it's that everybody was getting anxious. Maybe, you know, in the 2010s, Donald Trump or, or global warming, whatever you want to say, something made everybody anxious. No, that's not true. It's only the young people. Whatever it is, it didn't touch older people, but it really hit Gen Z uh, and some of the late millennials a little bit. The red, the red line there at the end. And of whatever happened, it's gendered. It's always very, very gendered. Um, so these are rates of depression. Uh, th these are not college students. This is a large national survey of American teens. And what you see is that girls, girls have always had higher rates of depression and anxiety. But once they hit puberty, especially girls' rates go up. That's always been the case. And until 2010, it was a, it was a substantial difference. Um, but after 2010, the rates go up a lot for both sexes. But because the girls' rate starts higher, you know, a 135% a, a increase is gigantic to the point where it's now just a normal part. If you're an American teenage girl, it's just normal that you are depressed and anxious. That's just typical. It's not literally the majority, but it's around 40% have one or the other. Around 40% of American teenage girls have a mental disorder related to depression and anxiety. It's absolutely unbelievable, but that's where we are. I want you to notice... Um, uh, we were confused during COVID because in, during COVID, we could see that our kids were not all right. And people thought, oh, well, it's because of COVID. No, it was not because of COVID. It was, it was already baked in by 2019. You can see that rates went up a little bit because of COVID in 2021, the lockdowns, 2020, 2021. But by 2022, they're just back to the trend line. COVID was not a major part of this story. Um, now, some people say, well, this is just self-report data. Kids are... Gen Z is more used to talking about this. This is a good thing that they're honest about their mental state. But if that was true, if this was all just a moral panic over self-report data, then we wouldn't see the same pattern when we look at behavior. But we do. This is um, uh, this is the number per 100,000. It's actually emergency room visits. So these are kids, uh, girls on top, kids who were brought to emergency rooms for self-harm, non-fate. It was not considered... Uh, it, well, it was usually it's cutting. They cut themselves is the main way. Also taking overdoses of their psychiatric medications. So again, no trend before 2010. And then this happens. Um, these are these are little girls. I mean, these are just beginning puberty. They're, they're 10 to 14 years old. They didn't used to cut themselves. They didn't used to harm themselves. Uh, but now the rate has almost tripled um, since, since 2010. And um, it's not just self-harm. It's also suicide. Uh, again, th we... While the numbers are larger for the older teens, the increase is enormous. The increase is especially concentrated in the younger teen girls. They're the ones who've gotten completely shredded um, in the 2010s by social media and, and other things. So these are American suicide rates. Until 2010, there's no real trend. And then this happens. And this includes a 67% increase in suicides in a single year, 2013. I wonder what happened in 2012. Um, so we see, and now here, it's very important to note, we're often focusing on the girls for depression, anxiety, but boys have higher suicide rates. Um, many more boys kill themselves than girls. Boys, uh, girls tend to use sleeping pills or reversible means. Boys tend to use a gun or a tall building. At least in the US, they use a gun or a tall building. So boys tend to choose irreversible means. Um, but this is what has happened to our, to our kids. Um, now, we've got a bunch of data on the UK as well. So here are your self-harm rates uh, taken from, uh, it was an interesting study done by Sibulski et al. They looked at medical records to, um, to and they, co they collated things between hospitals and doctors. So again, no trend before 2010, and then this happens. Again, what something happens in 2012 makes the rates skyrocket. Um, 
And here's uh, an additional study I came across recently, or Zach found. Um, this study, oh, I don't have the name of the organization here, but this was, um, but as you can see, uh, oh, this is full-time uh, university students. I'm surprised the rates were so low in 2010. Only, you know, less than 1% were classified as, or self-classified as having a mental health condition. And as you can see, the numbers go up for the for males and for females, but they go way, way up for, for female college, for female university students. It's the same thing in, in Australia. It's the same thing in New Zealand. We, we have similar graphs. Uh, here's data from Canada. It's a different graph. This is the percent of the population who said they have very good or excellent mental health on a five-point scale. The top line is the youngest women. Uh, the 15 to 30-year-old Canadian women used to be the happiest. That's the un universal pattern across the West, that the happiest people are uh, young adults and people in their, uh, in their 60s and 70s. Not anymore. Across the Western world, especially the English-speaking world, the least happy people are young adults there. Uh, and that is new. It wasn't like that before 2010. Um, it's also showing up in loneliness in school all around the world. Once kids started bringing um, smartphones in their pockets to school, they pay attention to their smartphone all day long. Even if they're sort of talking to someone or even if they're sitting at lunch, half of their mind is on their smartphone. So they're not really connecting. So all over the world, all over the world, this is the largest uh, worldwide study of, of adolescents. It's focused on education, but there are six questions about school loneliness. Um, and as you can see, you know, all over the world, a little less in Asia, not much of an increase in Asia, but in Europe, Latin America, and the English-speaking countries, um, students are more likely to agree with statements like, I feel lonely at school. It wasn't like that before 2012, and now it is. Now, why is this happening? At the same time, in many countries, and why does it hit young teen girls the hardest? It hits everyone, but it's young teen girls the hardest. And my argument in the book uh, is that it's because of the great rewiring of childhood. Um, we 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 clamp down on free play, which kids desperately need, um, and then we gave them a phone-based childhood instead of a play-based childhood. And that is not a humane way. It is inhuman to grow up on a phone. Kids need to be playing with each other, not just swiping on a phone for endless years and years. Um, and what Zach and I learned, Zach was in charge of figuring out exactly what happened, what happened to boys, what was the technology. And what we learned is that the internet came in in two waves. And the first wave was actually amazing. Many of you on the call remember the 90s when you got your first look at the internet, at Alta Vista was the first web browser. You could find anything in the world. It was, it was mind blowing and it wasn't harmful. So what we see is that in, in the 1980s and especially the 90s, Personal computers, uh, so in, in U.S. households by, uh, you can see by uh, about the year 2000, half of U.S. households have a personal computer and an internet connection, but it was slow dial-up internet. So teen mental health is fine. In fact, the millennials uh, who grow up with this first wave are actually a little healthier mentally than Gen X before them. It's the second wave. It's the combination of social media, which comes in around 2003 with MySpace and then Facebook, and then when you get, you, we put that on a smartphone so that you can be on Facebook or Instagram all the time, even when you're in bed, even when you're at school, even when you're on the school bus. That is the second wave. And that completely swamped Gen Z. I would say it created Gen Z. Uh, so I can illustrate it like this. Uh, at least American childhood, we used to think that kids are out playing on their own and they have all kinds of adventures that get into all kinds of trouble. In the United States, as you see in the bottom left, it used to just be a normal thing for kids to ride around their town on bicycles with an extraterrestrial creature in their basket. It's just something that we did. It was really fun. Um, but now it's this. This is what American childhood and I believe British childhood looks like. A boy is sitting there playing video games alone. Note that the boy has to be alone if he wants to play with his friends. If boys are having fun playing multiplayer video games, after school, they have to go home to their separate houses. Otherwise, they can't play together. They each need their own. We well, doesn't have a headset, but nowadays it's they have the headset, they have their own controller, their own screen. They have to be alone in order to play with each other. Uh, and of course, the girl just on her phone all afternoon. Uh, some UK data on this. Uh, this was a Guardian article a few years ago. A survey found that in the UK, uh, most children are not really allowed out on their own to play until they're 11 years old. And the lead author of the study said, the first problem is that children are not getting enough opportunities to develop their ability to assess and manage risk independently. That's crucial. A lot of this, a lot of the book is about how kids must be exposed to risk 
conflict, exclusion in limited quantities, but they need all of these things in order to grow strong. And we've denied them these opportunities. Second, she says, if children are getting less time to play outdoors in an adventurous way, this may have an impact on their mental health and overall well-being. Absolutely. That's what we've done to our kids. We took away the play-based childhood, which is what they need to grow strong. And then we gave them this phone-based childhood. Uh, here's a different uh, study. This is uh, backing up that previous study. Um, in the UK, compared to 1975, what are kids spending more time on? Screen-based activities, homework, and sport. What are they spending less time? Socializing outside the home and outdoor play. The bottom ones are the healthiest for their mental health. Uh, the the top ones, well, sport is sport is very good. Although my guess is uh, UK kids like American kids are more in organized sports where there's an adult telling them exactly what to do. There's a referee calling the plays. So organized sport is not as good as a pickup game where the kids work it out for themselves. In any case, our countries are on exactly the same path. We did exactly the same thing to our kids at pretty much the same time. Uh, here's American data on how much time uh, Americans spend with each other broken up by age. The top line is age 15 to 24. So, you know, teenagers and young adults. And of course, they're the ones who are spending, you can see there, two hours a day. They're spending with their friends up until 2012. Um, they're not married, you know, they don't have jobs for the most part. So they're spending a lot of time with their friends. Older people aren't. Oh, but then what happens? Everyone gets a smartphone and boom, uh, the, num the amount of time spent with friends drops, not so much for older people, but it drops and drops and drops for young people. They no longer see their friends. Take a look at this. The 2019 data was collected before COVID. The 2020 data was collected after shutdowns. Do you see a COVID effect there? Not really. Time was time with friends was dropping at the same speed uh, between 2019 and 2020 as it had between 2018 and 2019. In other words, Gen Z began social distancing in 2013 and 2014, and they were almost done by 2019. They were almost all done social distancing before COVID arrived. And it's worse than that because even when they're with their friends, they're not really fully with their friends. Uh, and we start them very early in the United States. I'm sure you do it here too. This uh, father put this video up on TikTok. He looked, take a look at this kid. He was so amazed at how quick his kid is. Isn't that great? Isn't that amazing? Can you imagine the brain of this child, of any child that is hyper-stimulated, that dopamine circuits triggered and triggered and triggered hour after hour? This has to have an effect. Um, and we give kids a phone as soon as we want a little time off. Uh, this was uh, uh, sent to me by a, uh, a guy who, it was a, this is a, a kid's soccer game. And obviously this is like a little sister and the, the dad gave her the phone. Here, you know, you sit on the ball, be quiet while I'm coaching my son. Uh, and we give them, in America, we give them toy iPhones when they're babies so that they can be just like mommy and daddy. This is a very disturbing short video of a Chinese child, a very young child who obviously has been swiping all day long. And here he is lying down, his eyes are closed and he can't stop his, he can't stop his hand from moving. He's very upset. You'll see he's kind of crying as he does this. He can't stop. So um, that's an overview. There's so much in the book. I, 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 I don't have time to go into all the harms. In fact, it takes a while just to list all the harms. I'll just list them. Um, so I have a whole chapter on the opportunity cost, how it pushes out everything else. We don't, it pushes out reading, it pushes out, especially it pushes out other kids. So that social deprivation, which I already showed you, it causes sleep deprivation. The phone-based life also causes attention fragmentation, an ability to focus, to stay on task during the crucial years of puberty, when the prefrontal cortex is wiring up and you're developing executive function, the ability to set a goal, figure out how to reach the goal, and then do it without getting distracted. That's a crucial human skill. It develops, especially during the teen years, and we give our kids disruptors. We give them executive function development disruptors, smartphones. Um, and finally, behavioral addiction. Uh, somewhere between two and 12%, something in that ballpark, uh, are what we would call addicted. There's a debate among the experts whether it's true addiction. But if you believe that gambling, that some people are compulsive gamblers and they ruin their lives and they spend their money and they get hooked on slot machines, these are very much like slot machines. Um, there's a whole story, there's a whole chapter on girls because girls are much more affected by social media than our boys. For these reasons, again, there's so much to say. I, I can, all I can do is just show you the list and there's more even than this. I'm sure, especially the women on the call will recognize what was it like to be an 11, 12, 13 year old girl before social media. And now look at all these things and just think what would it be like if all day long you're on this device 
listening to other girls talking about how depressed and anxious they are and commenting on, on each other's pictures and spreading rumors and having rumors spread about you. So girls, again, the young girls, especially the what we call middle school around age 11 to 13, they're really just getting destroyed. Um, this I just saw this in Unheard the other day, uh, and I see it. My daughter is in ninth grade; she's uh, fourteen, and you know, beginning in seventh grade, too, when they were like twelve, thirteen, they began going to Sephora a lot. Girls are spending money on anti wrinkle products and skincare products. These are eleven year old girls, uh, and they're getting sucked into this idea that what matters about them is their is their facial beauty, and then later their bodily beauty. The boy the boy story is a little different. Zach worked this out. Um, it's not that they suddenly get depressed in 2013. They actually began retreating from the real world since the 70s and 80s. Um, girls in the United States and the UK, we have uh, Richard Reeves is a really brilliant British uh, academic who moved to America, married an American woman, works at the Brookings, worked at Brookings, uh, and he has this great book called Of Boys and Men. So those of you who want to understand what's happening to boys, I really recommend that book, Richard Reeves, R-E-E-V-E-S, Of Boys and Men. Uh, so Richard helped us work out this story. Um, and as boys begin caring less about school, they do badly in school, the girls are rising up. School is structurally sexist, we might say. That is, school, at least as we have it in the United States, is designed around girls' abilities. Um, we keep cutting back on recess. We keep cutting back on rough and tumble play. Don't run around. Don't wrestle. Don't do anything that boys want to do. Just sit in your seat. Um, uh, so Boys have been dropping out of school in America, at least. Girls totally dominate at every level, high school, college, uh, master's degree, PhD, lawyers, doctors, everything. Girls are rising, boys are falling. Boys are checking out. What are they doing? They're living their life online. They can have, you know, boys want to practice uh, play war. They've got amazing video games. Boys want to look at naked girls and, and have sexual satisfaction. Much easier to just go to Pornhub. You don't have to be any age. You can, you know, you can be three and go to Pornhub if you can type. Um, so boys are not being shredded in the same way, but they're being sort of sucked dry. They're being sort of pulled out of the real world um, and into this make-believe world where they practice skills that are of no use in the real world. The net effect, I believe, is that boys are simply failing to do the things that would over time turn them into men. The net result is that even though boys and girls uh, arrive at this by different paths, uh, they're all incredibly lonely. I, I, should, I shouldn't say they're all, but compared to how it used to be, uh, this is agreement with the this, with this statement, I often feel lonely. And as you see, girls and boys agreement in the US was going down in the 80s and 90s. The millennials were actually doing pretty well. And then we enter this period and all of a sudden there's an epidemic of loneliness. When girls move on to social media, it promises them connection, but it's shallow, superficial, competitive connection, and they're so lonely. When boys move on to video games and porn, it looks like it's real fun, and it is real fun while they're doing it, but it ends up pushing out actual time with other human beings, and they end up really lonely. So how do we solve this? And this is what Claire and Daisy figured out. This is what uh, many organizations, there are so many organizations started by mothers mostly who saw what, what this was doing to their kids, is that we have to do it together. Um, everyone's stuck in a collective action problem. We give our kid a phone when they're 10 because everyone else did. We don't want to, but we feel as though if I don't give my kid a phone, she's cut off. I don't want that. I want her to belong. I want her to have friends. But if we all commit to these norms, or if even half of us commit to these norms, it becomes easy. So no smartphone before high school, no social media. High school is in the US around age 14. And I, in the UK, I know you guys are settling on 14. That's great. That, I think that's the right, the right age. Not that 14 is safe for a smartphone, but it's a realistic bright line. You, know, you may want to wait even longer than that, but 14, if we're going to have a norm, I think it needs to be 14. 16, I think would be, we wouldn't achieve it. We wouldn't get people to go along. 14, I think we can do. Um, that doesn't mean you can't give them a phone. You, you know, I'm sure you'd be nervous about sending your 12-year-old out into the world without a phone. Give them a flip phone. Flip phones are fine. All they do is communicate, texting and calling. Um, no social media before 16, phone-free schools, and much more childhood independence and free play. Those are the four norms. If we do those, we will roll back the phone-based childhood. We will bring the rates of mental illness down sharply. I can't promise you that, but everything I've seen it tells me that these reforms, each one is effective. You put them all four together, and I think it's going to be really, really effective. Um, this is a cartoon that we found. It's in the book. Uh, it's a mother and father handing something to their kid. 
And the caption is, it's been so nice getting to interact with you for these past six years. Here's your first device. Um, I have an article in the Atlantic called Get Phones Out of Schools Now, where I go through the research showing just how devastating it is for attention and learning to have a distraction machine in your pocket. They need to be locked up. Every school that bans phones loves it. I've, I, I've put a call out on Twitter. Can anyone find a story about a school that went phone free and that had problems or regretted it? Nobody. No one can find a story. All schools should go phone free. Lock the phones up in the morning. Don't let them stay in pockets or backpacks. Um, uh, the people focus on the phone side, but I want to really emphasize the play side. Uh, so please go to letgrow.org. This was started by Lenore Skenazy, an American woman who wrote Free Range Kids, uh, and me and Peter Gray, a play researcher. Um, and we have some amazing projects, the Let Grow Project. It's a homework assignment. Uh, kids are told, let's say a third of, you know, eight, nine, 10 year old kids, go home, talk to your parents, figure out something that you want to do on your own that you've never done before, and then do it. And you do that once a week for five or 10 weeks. And within a couple of weeks, kids are confident, they're less anxious, they're outside, they're going they're going to the corner store, they're cooking dinner. It's really transformative. You can do this by yourself and your family, but it's much more powerful if it's assigned as homework. And then many parents who are afraid to let their kid walk three blocks to buy a quart of milk, well, it's a homework assignment and everyone else is doing it. So, okay, do it. And then the kid comes back and they're jumping up and down. I did this with my kids. They're just jumping up and down because it was a little scary the first time they went out. And that's how kids grow, by being a little bit afraid. And then you succeed. And then the next time you're not afraid anymore. Um, so that's it. Uh, and then just this morning, this is something, whenever I speak to audiences of young people, I gave a, a Zoom lecture to a high school in, in Houston, Texas today, and I asked them a bunch of questions. If you could go back in time, these are around uh, you know, 14 to 18, 14 to 17 year olds. If you could go back in time, would you prefer that social media was never invented or that as happened that you all went through puberty using social media? Overwhelmingly, the kids say they wish social media had never been invented. And this has been replicated many times. Even if they're, they're addicted to it, Gen Z is not in denial. They see that this is messing them up. And, and when you say, what if everybody was off it? Would you like that? And they say, yes, we wish everyone was off. We wish nobody had it. We wish it was never invented. So those are the four norms that, that Zach and I are advocating. Um, this is uh, what we're saying in our book. This is what we think the cause of the problem is. Um, I hope everybody on this call will go to smartphonefreechildhood.co.uk, join the movement. That's how we're going to roll this back. That's how we're going to beat this. Each of us on our own, we're frustrated. We're not powerful. But if we combine, we can roll this back within two years. Um, I, I sometimes liken it to the fall of the Berlin Wall. I traveled behind the Iron Curtain in 1987. Everyone hated communism. There were no communists in 1987. Um, there was just fear. And once the Berlin Wall fell and people realized, wait, you mean we can change this? They changed it right away. I believe that 2024 is going to be for the phone free for the for the phone free childhood movement what 1989 was for Soviet communism. So uh, I hope you will uh, subscribe to uh, Zach and I run a Substack at afterbabble.com. It's free. Please sign up. You'll get our research updates. You'll get all kinds of great essays from from experts from from Gen Z. Um, I hope you'll all pre-order The Anxious Generation. It comes out next Tuesday. Uh, and I hope you'll all uh, check out the uh, Let Grow. And uh, I guess you could start one in the UK or just use our Let Grow. And so I will stop there. I will unshare my screen. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit. Uh, I'll talk uh, with Daisy and Claire. Thank you, Jonathan. That was, I mean, incredibly illuminating and incredibly alarming. Um, a question that we've had sent in is about whether there is consensus amongst the academic community about the impacts of smartphones on children, or whether it's still a matter for debate. Yeah. And if it is, is that the result of industry-sponsored academic washing, companies like Meta and yeah. TikTok, um, paying for academics to conduct studies that promote their agenda? That's from Hugh, that question. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, so no, there is not consensus among the academics. Uh, and that's part of why there hasn't been movement until now. Um, and I can explain why about a lot of uh, uh, Substack posts explaining exactly what's going on. But in brief, it's this. Um, Gene Twangy and I are on one side. There are about five uh, other psychologists, other researchers who are on the other side. Um, they point out that the correlations are usually fairly small. Now, they say the correlation between 
screen use and mental illness is like tiny, like R equals 0 0.02, 0 0.04, that would be zero. But what Gene and I find is that whenever you look at what they're saying and you say, well, you're talking about all screens for all kids? No, let's look at social media for girls. You always get a correlation much higher. And now the skeptics, they actually say this, they actually agree, but they just say, oh, you know, 0.13, it's not high enough. But no, it is high enough to explain a doubling of the rate. So the correlational data is very clear. It's much larger than the skeptics used to say, and they admit it. But the real, uh, uh, the real area of debate is around the experiments. So they used to say, oh, it's all correlational. You know, correlation doesn't prove causation. Uh, and that was true in 2019. There were some experiments then, but not a lot. There have been a lot of experiments since then. Um, uh, Zach and I run a, uh, some Google Docs. Uh, Zach, if you put it in the chat, the or just or just go no, just go to Jonathan Height. Actually, yeah, Zach, JonathanHeight.com/slash/reviews. You can find all our Google Docs. Uh, there are about 25 experiments, random, you know, RCTs, random control trial experiments, and uh, the great majority of them do find a significant effect. Uh, some of them don't. But here's the thing. The ones that don't find a significant effect, they usually use a delay period of like a day or two. So if you take kids off of their phones or social media for a day, are they going to be happier? Hell no. They're addicted. If you take a heroin addict off of heroin for a day or two, they're miserable. But almost all the studies that kept them off for three or four weeks find a benefit. So if the null hypothesis was true, if there's nothing going on here, we would not repeatedly find these patterns, but we repeatedly find these patterns. And I thought the game was, if you have the correlational studies and you have the experiments, you've shown causation. So I think we've shown causation, but we still get, and to the second part of the question, we still get these reports saying, oh, well, uh, no, there's, there's no effect. And there was a bizarre report from the National Academy of Sciences in the United States uh, and there were several of the skeptics was were on this the panel that wrote this, and they had other researchers working for them. And they interviewed me and Gene Twangy, and they didn't quote us at all. But that that's not the issue. The issue is chapter four. Actually, Zach, if you could put the link um, to that report, um, uh, chapter four of that report reviews the harms, and there are so many harms. Like it, it shows harm after harm. This causes this. This causes this. This causes this. Yet somehow, the leadership of this panel that wrote this report, they say, there we find that there is no compelling evidence that social media or smartphones are causing this problem. It's a bizarre report. And we, we don't know, I don't want to make accusations, but it does seem like motivated reasoning that the, the claim in the report contradicts the content of the report. So um, Gene and I and Zach are working very hard to explain um, why this is. If there are any data geeks, if anyone wants to get into the argument, go to our sub stack. Uh, and I think it's uh, what why the skeptics think I'm wrong. I, I, uh, maybe Zach put that one in the, put our sub stack post uh, there too. That really goes into why the I, why I think the skeptics are just wrong. And now it is it has been established. John, could I add in one thing real, real quick on that? So there's one other aspect to the research debate that John really uh, convinced me about, which is the network effect. So mm -hmm. we were talking before about the collective action problems and almost all the research that's done is asking kids or people to stop using social media for a couple of days and see how you feel. But if you're the only one doing that, you're going to be more isolated, more disconnected from everybody else around you. And so again, none of very few of these studies are looking at how this is happening at a network level, at a group level. Yeah. And it's part of the reason why we are so strong on phone-free schools. And let's look at what happens when an entire group of people come together to make this kind of change. That's when we're gonna really see the change. Thank you, Zach. That's, what, that's where you get the big effects is when you change the community, not just a few individuals. I want to ask about, um, one of the reasons that lots of people say they want to get a smartphone for their kids is obviously so they can track their children um, when they're going to school or wherever they're going. Yeah. Um, obviously, we couldn't track our children 15 years ago, and there wasn't that fear. I'm interested yeah. psychologically, where has this fear come from? Is it from 24-hour you know, news media? Yeah. Is this coming from the tech companies? Is this a little bit of scaremongering? Where is this this fear yeah. come from and this need to track? Yeah. There's a fantastic book by a British sociologist, Frank Faraday, F-U-R-E-D-I. The book is called Paranoid Parenting. And he describes what happened in Britain in the 90s, how this changed in the 90s in Britain. 
Uh, but he makes it clear, like that we're hearing the same stories in the U.S. Um, so a bunch of things happen. Um, we have smaller families, so there are fewer kids around. Um, women are working, so moms aren't home, eyes on the street. If a kid gets in trouble or falls down on their bicycle, there's not some mother around who can say, "Oh, you know, come out. You know, what's your what's your phone number? I'll call your mom." Um, and so what Ferrady points to as the, as the central thing that happened, he calls the collapse of adult solidarity that is adults stop trusting each other and he has all these stories you guys were even ahead of us in paranoia um apparently your daycare centers if you bring your kid to a daycare center even in the 90s daycare centers in the uk would promise closed circuit television you can watch all day long from your office you can see exactly what's happening with your child because you know we don't expect you know you're not going to trust these people to take care of your child what if they sexually molest them? We all got obsessed with these sexual molestation cases. And there were some that were real, but there were a lot in the US about daycare daycare workers that were doing satanic sexual abuse to children. None of that happened. That never happened. So for a variety of reasons related to changing media, changing family style, changing sociological things, we lost trust in each other. And we felt we're all on our own to protect our child in a dangerous world. The irony is that the world actually was kind of dangerous when I was growing up. I was I grew up in the 70s. There were drunk drivers all over the place. There were pedophiles and perverts who were sought, thought to be eccentric. They weren't locked up. By the 90s, we locked up all the drunk drivers. Now there's like no more drunk driving. And we locked away all the sex predators for life. So um, now there are still sex predators, but they're not on the playgrounds. They're all on Instagram. It's really dangerous to try to approach a child at a playground. It's really easy to approach children on Instagram. That's really interesting. Thank you. And actually, that leads me to what the next question I wanted to ask, which is, if we take the phones away, there's a gap, isn't there? There's a void. Um, communities have, have changed. We're all working more. We're having fewer children. There are fewer children around. And at the same time, youth clubs have closed down and there's far less provision. So yeah, that's true. what do we do if we take those screens away? It's going to take a long time for those things to come back or, you know, they may not mm -hmm. come back. So what do we yeah. do? What's the answer to that? Yes. So that's why the fourth norm is so important far more independence, replay, and, and responsibility in the real world. Uh, so yes, we don't wanna just take the screens away and let them be bored. Now there is some value to boredom. Maybe they might read a book. They might learn to knit as my daughter did. Although she helped her, she actually used YouTube to learn how to how to knit. Um, so I'm not, saying, I'm not saying keep them away from the internet entirely. I'm saying don't give them a device in their hand that they have with them all the time. You know, sure, you should have a computer in your house, and you know, even when your kid is seven, eight, nine, they should be using the internet for certain things. They should be watching videos on YouTube that are so. You know, this is not a total screen deprivation thing. This is just, you know, in the U.S., it's it's uh, eight or nine hours a day is what our kids spend on recreational screen time, um, not counting homework, not counting school. Eight or nine hours. The number I saw in Britain was more, ten to eleven. I don't know how that's possible, but British kids were found to spend ten to eleven hours on screens that pushes out everything else we've got to get that number down mm -hmm. what do we replace it with um i think to the question we can't just say go out and play don't come back till dinner time that's what all american parents used to say Every, you know everyone my age remembers that line don't come back to like i don't want to see you get out of the house um you, i understand we can't quite do that today so we have to be more intentional um, one thing i think is that the most fun times in childhood are not necessarily with you playing with one friend. It's when you have a gang, you have a group, you have a group of kids who hang out together. Um, so if you can find a group of three or four or five kids where the families all feel similar, they all want to find a more play-based childhood. Um, and then you just, you know, you rotate. I mean, maybe you have piano lessons on Monday or, you know, one or two days a week when you have something, but you should have a couple days a week if possible when you don't have schedule activities and you and three other families you agree, the kids get together. One day it's at my house, one day it's at your house. One day, one of us drives them to a shopping mall, you know, if they're like 10, 11, 12 years old, or, or a pizza parlor or a movie theater, drop them off, let them watch a movie together, we'll pick you up, you know, so, or, you know, ride bicycles if you can. So I think we have to be more intentional as parents than our parents or grandparents were, but it can be done. Um, let Grow suggests what we call play club. It's so simple, play club, all it is, is the the school opens the playground an hour early from 7 to 8 a.m. Because what the kids really want to do is run around with each other. In the United States, they get on average 20 to 30 minutes of recess a day. Federal prisoners in maximum security prisons are guaranteed two hours a day 
of outdoor time. Our kids get 25 minutes. Um, so open up the playground for an hour beforehand and leave it open from three to 5 p.m. And kids can, families can sign up so that we, you know, it's a regular group of kids. On Thursdays, I have play club. I just hang out at the playground with other kids because parents do trust the school's playground. That is one place they're willing to just let the kids run around. So fine, let them run around the playground. That's especially when they're younger, you know, maybe six or seven to 10. Um, once they're, you know, 12, 13, 14, well, but once they're 13, 14 years old, they should be out on their own. They should be out, you know, getting ice cream, you know, going to see movies, play, playing sports. They should be out on their own at that age. What do you what do you guys think? What would Claire and Daisy, what would your answer be for advising other UK parents? I think what you've just said is amazing. The idea of just families, you know, a few families together with with kids. And uh, yeah, I've just been kind of thinking we already kind of do that, but but absolutely, yeah. Um, just kind of making that a bit more structural. Um, I love that idea. I think it I do think it's about solidarity, isn't it? You do need to yeah. find those people who feel the same. Um and feel like you can talk about this whole thing rather than it being this awkward thing that you can't talk about actually really addressing it and as you say being intentional Daisy I don't know what your views are um well I've, I've got a burning burning question that from um the community that I want to ask about um legislation and governments and what they can do before we run out of time um so I mean they've only been with us 15 years but it already feels like there's no way we can turn back and like this is it and that's an argument people often give but you put in your book quite a few few sort of solutions and things that government and tech can do quick yeah. not quick but like things that would solve this what what are those main ones if you were in charge what are the changes that you'd make yeah well the first thing i would do is i would reform the u.s congress that can actually function we don't have a functioning legislature in my country um so we're we're hopeless and um it's easily bought by the tech industry so we're not going to actually get any relief in the u.s our state governments are doing some things but they'll probably be challenged in court but I am so inspired that in the UK, you have a functioning parliament. Your parliament can actually address problems and pass laws. Now, you may not agree with it, but, but you, your government can do things. Ours can't. Um, and your government has done things. You have, there's this wonderful woman in the House of Lords, uh, Biban Kidron is her name. Uh, she runs Five Rights and I forget what else, but she was the force behind the, uh, what was it called? Well, it's you know the age appropriate design code. It had, there was another name for it, but it was passed into law and it's been it's being implemented. Um, it mandates a duty of care that the tech companies have a duty of care. They need to treat children differently from adults, and they're not. They're not treating children differently from adults. You know, in a free market society, you can exploit your customers, and if the customers don't like it, they can go elsewhere. But we shouldn't be treating children that way. So anyway, in the UK, you've passed the age appropriate design code, which was the model for California passed their own version of it. So the UK is leading the way on this. Um, uh, you're, you, know, you're, you have sort of at a national level phone-free schools. In the US, the education department is very weak because our constitution says all that stuff is state level. So, But we are finding states, uh, Florida just mandated phone-free schools. Um, so government can really help us out by solving collective action problems. In fact, that's one of the main reasons why there are governments is that there are things that have to be that we can't do as individuals. And we need somebody to organize the road system and the weights and measures and the money. You know, like these are collective action problems. We need standardization. Uh, and so the most important thing that can be done, and it's not going to happen in the US, but it could happen in Britain, is age verification. Um, so right now, there is no age verification anywhere on the web except for some financial transactions. There are some things there. Um, but you know, pornography sites, Pornhub, Instagram, TikTok, you can be three and just sign up if you can type, as I said, um, because the US Congress wrote a stupid law in, in 1998 uh, that said companies can't just take data. You can't, you can't just bring in these kids and take their data without their parents' knowledge or permission until they're 13. At 13, you can do whatever you want to them. Now, that was a stupid law to begin with. They also said, now, you know, the companies, we can't expect them to check ages. If they know that the person's underage, they can't serve them. But if they don't know, then, you know, whatever. So that's why there's no age, and, no age verification at all um, on the internet uh, for these sites. And what I think needs to happen is we need to treat it like as we do bars and casinos and strip clubs and and brothels and hookah club, you know, hookup, like any place where adult activities are going on, we don't want children. Imagine if we said, 
you know, keeping kids out of bars and strip clubs, that's the parents' responsibility. We can't expect a strip club to check ID when people are walking in. Like, how could they do that? So that's where we are. That would be a game changer um, if, if Congress or the parliament would raise the age to 16 and mandate that to the companies, you guys figure it out. You are brilliant. You can solve this. You figure out how to do age verification. We're not going to tell you. We're not going to say you have to show your driver's license. You, you figure it out, but you're responsible for what you're doing, for the mess you're creating. Um, in the US, Congress granted these companies complete immunity from lawsuits. Um, we can't sue them for destroying our kids. Now we're that's section 230 of a it's a particular legal battle. It's it's crazy. But you don't have that in the UK. Um, so I hope you've got lawsuits. I hope parents are suing the hell out of Meta in particular and TikTok. Um, so yeah, uh, in fact, I would say we're counting on you since we're paralyzed in the US. So we're counting on you to actually show what government can do. No pressure, um, thank you. <clears throat> that's really interesting. We've had people getting in touch saying that it's a human rights issue and that we should use the law to do something about it. So we're exploring That's a that. good angle. Yeah, we need to try a variety of angles and see what works through the courts. Mm. Um, we've just got a quick question about um, how re, you know how we can rewire our brains. We're all dopamine addicts now, yeah. and you in your book you suggest a few like fast hacks to sort of getting back into our real human brains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know the book is really focused on younger kids, and I think middle school, early puberty is where we can have an enormous impact without a lot of effort. We really need to work on the young kids, especially because we really can protect them from all of this. What do we do for the older kids, you know, who are in their late teens or 20s? And what do we do for ourselves? Most of you are probably in your 30s, 40s. Um, what do we do? Uh, well, if you were an adult when all this stuff came in, it didn't scramble your brain. You're probably feeling exhausted. You're probably feeling frazzled and confused. That's the way I usually feel. We're overwhelmed by the amount of stuff coming in. Um, what I've learned in working with my students, I teach a course at NYU called Flourishing, uh, and the students are mostly 19 years old. They're sophomores, and um, um, and they all are addicted. I shouldn't say addicted. They all, their phone basically runs their life. And I work with them a lot on improve. I start by improving their morning routine, their evening routine. Actually, start with the evening, which is more important. Evening routine. What are you doing before you go to bed? Let's improve that. Let's improve your sleep. Um, let's make sure you're fully rested overnight. Um, now, in the morning, what do you do? And what I found is that they almost all say the last thing they do before they close their eyes, because I, I should, what's the countdown? Like what's the fifth to the last thing for, you know, they almost all say the last thing they do is check their texts and messages and then they close their eyes. And what do you think the first thing is that they do in the morning when they open their eyes? Same thing. And what do you think they do in between waking up in the morning and going to sleep? A lot of this. So once I show them that this thing has become their master, that they have no attention of their own, they have no attention to do anything, and these are students in a business school. They want to be successful. You know, they've they've chosen NYU Stern because they want a, a successful career. Once I show them, if you give away all of your attention, you'll never do anything. You're not going to amount to anything if you let your phone take all your attention. So, so we work on how to do that. The most important thing um, is to just cut the notifications by ninety percent. Um, mm -hmm. They all have we all have on our phones, and I urge you to do this. Go into uh, settings. Notifications, look how many notifications you get a day. That's how many times your phone interrupts you every day. Turn off notifications from almost all apps, certainly all news sources. Don't let breaking news ever interrupt you. You check the news twice a day, that's fine. Um, but my students are able to cut their notifications by like 70% and they get the ability to think again. They can go 10 minutes without interruption. So there's a lot we can do to cope with this, but it absolutely requires spending far less time on social media. Um, uh, group chats, group texts are overwhelming these days. So we have to get control of that if we want to actually you know, be directors of our lives rather than just air traffic controllers frantically trying to handle the incoming. Yeah, that's a really good point. Since this movement started, I'm on 60 different WhatsApp communities. Yeah, right. and yeah, it's, it's overwhelming. It's impossible. It's, it's insane, de yeah. definitely. I mean, um, I'm interested to know just like one of the last questions, like in terms of this movement that has sprung up here in the UK, mm -hmm. how do you view that in context of like historically of, of like the tech companies and the iPhones mm -hmm. and what, what, why do you think it's happened now? And what, what does it tell us about society and where we're at? Yeah. 
Well, so when all this began, we were incredibly optimistic about this stuff. In the 90s, we thought the internet was the greatest thing ever invented. And I think it actually is. And the early internet was just marvelous. There were some bad parts to it, but it was, you know, everybody looks back at that time like, wow, that was fun. That was amazing. It re in the US, it wasn't really until Donald Trump was elected. And it was clear that lots of bad actors can use this to hack elections. And the Brexit campaign, Facebook played a low road in that. So it's really 2016, 2017 is when we begin to turn. We're not techno optimists. We see, wait, maybe this isn't good for democracy. Maybe this isn't good for our kids. We started raising the question. And Gene Twenge and I were really working on this in 2017, 2018, 2019. We were making, you know, making a little progress on this. And then COVID happens. And that's all everyone thinks about. So COVID confused us. And COVID basically stopped our progress on questioning these devices. Gene and I were saying in 2019, what kids really need is less time on their devices, more time outside playing with each other. COVID comes in, we say, no time outside playing with each other. We were insane. I mean, it was not transmitted by touch, but we locked our kids up all day long on screens. So um, we did, and then of course they're miserable and we think, oh, COVID. Like, no, it wasn't COVID. It was the lockdowns and the screens. Anyway, the point is, um, as COVID is fading and as the wreckage is now clear, it's now really clear what's happened. Everybody sees it. Business people see it, people hiring young people, they see they're very hard to employ, they're very fragile, everyone sees it. So that's why I think it's now happening, it's happening right now, we're able to see it. Um, I think the you know, there's an interesting thing about the internet is that it doesn't care about national borders, it doesn't know about national borders, but it does care about language. So I think there's an emerging sense of the Anglo world because we're all so easily united, Australia is not as far away as it was before the internet. Um, we're all much more easily united. We all have similar political values that are easily hacked by social media. Um, our form of liberal democracy is really susceptible to this more so than, you know, French, they have more like con central control and the Chinese, not democracy, but, you know, so, um, so I, I, I'm very excited. In the US, we have a phrase that the states are laboratories of democracy. Try something in Oregon, maybe it'll work in Tennessee. But I actually think of the Anglo countries as being like that. We have similar cultures, similar political cultures to some extent. There are differences, of course. Um, but you guys are leading in the UK. You're trying things. And if they work, you know, like with the, uh, the age appropriate design code, we'll try them here. So please keep innovating and let's learn from each other. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, just to finish off, I've just got a few questions I'd love to ask in terms of so we find that, you know, we're very sold on this idea, but there is pushback from, from other people, of course, and different Tell views. me what, what's the pushback? I don't find any pushback. What do you hear? Well, so what, what I'd love to do is just do a very quick fire. These are the things that we, we hear. Mm -hmm. And what would be your, you know, kind of one line counter argument to these? All right, so, let's go. That sounds fun. Uh, <laughs> a lightning round. Um, okay. So, you know, children need to learn tech early. They need to get phones at 11 or 12, because they need to learn how to use all of these apps while we as parents are there able to, to show mm -hmm. them. Well, I'd say the same is true for, for alcohol, for intercourse, for gambling. Like, why not start them at 10? We don't want them to just suddenly be immersed in it at 18. I mean, it's going to take them a long time to figure out how to use Instagram, right? I mean, it takes years to figure that out. So yeah, we better start them young. That's a ridiculous argument. I've heard it too, but it doesn't make any sense. I'm going to write that one down. Definitely. Thank you. Um, another one we hear a lot is, you know, the genie's out of the bottle. Text hits mm -hmm. day. Why are you trying to, you know, you can't push back against it. It's too late. You know, you kind of, you're a Luddite. You've yeah. got to give up. That's the main argument that I hear. Um, and, uh, you know, if a train has left a station and we know that it's heading for a bridge that has collapsed, what are we going to say? You know, we, we, we can't call it back. It's left the station. You know, we'd call ahead. We'd have someone, you know, put a flag down. Um, so that's not, a, a real argument. Um, what it's really saying is just that it's going to be difficult. That's all. It just says it's going to be difficult. And I agree. It's going to be difficult. Um, it's actually going to be much easier than anything else I've tried to reform because we don't actually have to persuade people. Almost everybody agrees with us. So I actually think we're going to win on this. Um, the only opponent I find, the only, other than these few researchers that I have a debate with, the only opponent that I find is resignation. The feeling that we can't do anything about this. If it's really true, that an entire generation is being damaged emotionally and blocked developmentally, that they are miserable, lonely, um, the, the boys are dropping out of life. Are we going to say, yeah, but what are you going to do? We have to just accept that. Like, hell no. Um, first of all, we should just try everything. We have to try everything. 
And guess what? We've tried phone-free schools and it works amazingly well and the kids are happy. And we've tried giving them more independence and it works amazingly well and the kids are happy. So like we have things that work, let's just do them. Mm. I think very linked to that is, you know, a thing we hear a lot about, well, I don't want my child to go and not be able to communicate with their, their friends on WhatsApp or Snapchat, mm -hmm. whatever it is. It's a hard decision to make as a parent. Um, what what do you say to that? Well, I say they still have a computer. They can, you know, my daughter can do everything on the computer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, but does she need a computer with her in her pocket every moment? No. Now, does she need a communication device so that I can text her and I can track her? That there's debate on. And Lenore Skenazy says, no. She says, Lenore says, it's terrible that we track our kids. You know, they're growing up as, the, as if they were being raised in East Germany with the Stasi. Uh, so Lenore says, we should give kids true independence, let them out, let them be responsible for themselves. If they need to call us, they, they can ask someone to call. Um, you know, as a parent, I, I be a little uncomfortable with that. And, and especially in a large city like New York or London, I, I would be wary of that. Um, but so she might be right overall. Uh, but I'm willing to say, let's just get rid of the constant internet connection, but still allow us to communicate and then try to have norms. The norm should be, you never text your child when they're at school. You should never try to communicate with them. With it. Let them be in school. Uh, of course, the phone should be locked up. Um, but, but, you know, I think for now to, to not be too radical about it, let's just get the phone, the, the internet out of their pocket, but they can still use WhatsApp on a computer if they want, and they can still have a, a flip phone, which they can use to text. Absolutely. Thank you. And then the final one that I hear a lot, and I find it hard to know what the answer is, is, well, it's fine to have all these apps. We've got the controls. We, we check the apps. We know we've got the controls. They work. So it's all good. Um, have you guys found that to be true? Do you find that if you want to have a certain policy in your home, that it's actually easy to implement and mm -hmm. set, get all the settings on the devices? I don't. There are so many devices. It's so complicated. I don't want to get into the cat. So in America, a lot of people use, I think it's called Life 360, which sounds like it's straight out of Orwell or something. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's because with Life 360, you can control everything. You can read their texts coming in. You can see where they were. Now with the iPhone, I like to be able to know, oh, is my son on, is he on the way home? Is he on the subway? When is he coming home? I like to be able to check that. But I don't want the ability to see where he's been. I don't want the ability to see every track of every, you know, and then he comes, why were you, what were you doing over here? Why were you at 37th Street? Like that's a level of paranoia and control that's really bad for kids. So, um, so let, I, I, again, let's experiment with the middle way where we still have the ability to see where our kids are at the moment, but we need to kind of back off on the, on the, the, the mm -hmm. tracking. That's really interesting. Thank you so much. I think you've given us lots of ammunition to kind of answer those questions. Um, and I think we could carry on talking about this for hours, but unfortunately, I think we're out of time. So I just want to say a massive thank you to you, Jonathan. Thank you for starting this conversation that we clearly need to be having and giving us the data that actually helps kind of explain what's happening, what's going on here. Um, your book's out. We've read it. Um, we recommend that everyone on this call and all of our community does so as well. Um, and tell everyone about this this message. You know, it's the conversations that we have with our friends uh, at the school gates, I think, are going to really make that big difference. Um, you can all also subscribe to um, Jonathan's Substack as well. Um, and I just wanted to also mass massive thank you to our community who's here. I think, you know, the reason... John, you reached out to us is because of all the people who just suddenly rose up and, and got behind this cause. So thank you to all of you as well. Um, John, you've described 2024 as a tipping point and it really feels like it could be. It feels like we can change the norm on this. And, you know, there are so many norms that felt like they could never be changed. And then they did just, they got changed, That's didn't right. they? So That's right. it feels like we do have the power to do something here. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate your time. And um, oh. yeah. Well, th well, thank you, Claire. Thank you, Daisy. Thanks always to Zach. Um, please visit our, we have an amazing new webpage that Zach is leading up. Go to anxiousgeneration.com. We have this amazing guerrilla art project with these beautiful and disturbing posters going up on billboards in New York City, San Francisco, Washington. Um, beautiful stuff to put up on social media. If any of you are on Instagram, I'm all in favor of adults using social media to achieve their ends. I'm not in favor of social media using our kids to achieve their ends without our knowledge and permission. Um, so those of you on social media, please go to anxiousgeneration.com uh, and look at, uh, it'll say the art and we've got, uh, and resources. Zach just put up a page of resources, things for Instagram, things for different platforms. 
spread the message because again, it's a collective action problem. We, as individuals, we're weak, but when we work together, we can win and we're going to win on this, I believe. So thanks, Claire. Thanks, Daisy. Thank thanks to everyone so in the UK. Oh, and I'll be over in the UK. I'll be giving some talks in London um, uh, uh, April 28th through or 29th through um, through May 2nd. I guess we'll put something up. I might uh, either at the, maybe we'll have it on the page. I'm giving a talk at LSE and a public event curated by IQ Squared but I forget the venue. Sorry about that. Uh, well, you know what? You, you'll have an email list, so you'll yeah, yeah. sign up for uh, for smartphone free childhood. You'll you'll get you'll get emails about events, including my talks in London. So lovely. Thank you very much. And we've also there's a discount code for your book as well, which I think went out in our newsletter as well. Oh, that's right, so, at Waterstones. Yes. Yeah. So thank good. you so much to you, John, to you, uh, Zach, um, and to everyone here. Um, appreciate your time. See ya. Thank you. Good night. Good night.